and many times it's the man. It's the man who's got a food sensitivity or he has a zinc deficiency. Yes. I mean, every couple, I won't treat infertile couples unless the husband comes. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if husband doesn't come, you know, we just tell the woman, please don't come without your husband for the first visit. Welcome to Get Pregnant Naturally, where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby. Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Clark, and my mission is to inspire, motivate, and empower you. And most of all, I want you to wake up. With functional medicine, we can discover what causes infertility and eventually reverse the condition. Today, I'm welcoming Dr. Tom O'Brien to the podcast, and we're digging into how gluten sensitivity impacts fertility. Dr. Tom O'Brien is a graduate of the University of Michigan and the National College of Chiropractor. He is a diplomate of the National Board of Chiropractic Examiners, a diplomate of the Clinical Nutrition Board of the American Chiropractic Association, and a certified clinical nutritionist with the International and American Associates of Clinical Nutritionists. He is a certified applied kinesiologist, as well as a certified practitioner in functional biomechanics from the Motion Palpation Institute. He is a world-renowned expert in the field of gluten-related disorders, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, celiac disease, and they're linked to other chronic conditions, including autoimmune disorders and diseases. He is the founder of the doctor.com, which was created to educate the public about underdiagnosed and undertreated gluten-related disorders, which affect up to 30% of the population. He views the lack of recognition and diagnosis and treatment of these disorders as a massive public health crisis. Dr. O'Brien serves on the faculty of the Institute of Functional Medicine, his certified gluten practitioner course, revolutionize the way healthcare professionals and coaches diagnose and treat patients suffering from gluten-related disorders. Dr. O'Brien founded and hosted the world's first gluten summit, theglutensummit.com, where he interviewed 29 experts and opinion leaders on the topic of gluten-related health issues. Check out his website at thedoctor.com. And before we jump into today's show, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this to make sure you never miss an episode. Hey, Dr. Tom, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, excited to have you. So uh, yeah, if you could share your story as to how you came into this field and to do this work. Oh, sure. Uh, let's see. 1979, my ex and I were unable to get pregnant. And I was an intern at the time, and I called the um, seven most famous holistic doctors I'd ever heard of at the time and asked if I could speak with them. And I was able to speak with each one of them and ask, what, what do they do for infertility? And they'd say things like, well, do you know what a category one is? And I'd say, no. And they'd say, learn. Okay. Okay. And I'd write down category one. And I put a program together, and we were pregnant in six weeks. Oh, wow. And our neighbors in married housing, we lived on campus at the time, they had been through artificial insemination and nothing had worked. And they'd asked if I'd work with them. And I said, well, you know, it's not going to harm you in any way. Sure. She was pregnant and or they, they were pregnant in three months. So before I even got into practice, uh, we had patients coming from all over because we were so excited to be pregnant. We tell our friends about it and they tell their sister who would fly down or drive down from Wisconsin. I was in Chicago at the time, and I was seeing people and even before I got out into practice. And I learned a couple of things there, and there's not much in medicine that's all or every, but this is an every. In clinical practice, every patient that has any type of a hormone-related imbalance, it doesn't matter what it is, a hormone-related imbalance, Every single one of them were eating foods that the immune system was producing inflammation against, saying, this is not a good food for you. But because people didn't feel sick when they ate the food, uh, for example, only one out of every eight people with a sensitivity to wheat have gut issues. Mm. The other seven out of eight don't. They've got reproductive issues or brain issues or kidney issues, but no gut issues. So they can't tell that what they're eating is affecting them. And that, that was true for every couple that we worked with. And you know, so over the years, we've had lots of success. And one of the basic 101, every patient, every time 
we have to check for and then uh, eliminate the foods that are identified that their immune system are fighting. I love it. It's, uh, it's really diet is the, what I find is the last place people check into, whereas I, like you, are saying is the first. That's right. It's got to be the first because anytime you have dysfunction or dis-ease, anytime, almost all dysfunction is an inflammation. There's a state of inflammation going on and it just depends. Is it a kidney cell or a brain cell? Is it a testicular cell or a liver cell? And is it gasoline or kerosene? But at the cellular level, the cells are always on fire. There's inflammation. So you have to identify where is the inflammation and what's the fuel feeding the fire. Mm -hmm. So in our couples coaching program, we, we help couples that are trying to conceive. It's typically a female infertility. But can well, you, I'm not so sure about that. Th- yeah, yeah, definitely. That's that's how, that's how we. Yeah, actually, yeah, because as we, they they may come in with you know a diagnosis of of low ovarian reserve or premature ovarian failure or endometriosis, fibroids, those sort of things, and they may say that their partner is is fine. As we actually dig into their health history and look at their blood chemistry, we find things for them to work on as well. But and I guess the people that come to me are typically women that are struggling with with. Fertility. Yes, exactly. It's the women who are on the front edge of that. And guys, right. you know, for for most guys, the only test that's done is sperm count mm-hmm. and sperm motility. Right. It's the same test that's been done for 20 years. And so that when that test comes back and if everything's okay, the guy breathes a sigh of relief and says, must be you, honey. Mm-hmm. And, but, all, but all the tests are negative for the woman, but then it's the woman that gets shot full of hormones and has her entire endocrine system knocked out of balance trying to find a way to bring some kind of uh, stability to uh, this coupling. And many times it's the man. It's the man who's got a food sensitivity or he has a zinc deficiency. Yes. I mean, every couple, I won't treat infertile couples unless the husband comes. Mm-hmm. And uh, if, if husband doesn't come, you know, we just tell the woman, please don't come without your husband for the first visit. Oh, he said it's fine. Anything I want to do? No, 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 no. We have to run a few tests on him. So please make sure he comes with you. And if he doesn't come, we send him home. Uh, that, uh, you know, we're very clear on our communication. And if, you know, all right, you don't want to do your thing. Because many times there's a really simple test, a zinc insufficiency. When a man ejaculates inside a woman, there are millions of sperm swimming up the canal. Millions. Why is it that only one sperm gets through? Maybe two, but usually just one. Well, that sperm hits the outside of the egg and the outside of the egg has a force field around it or else hundreds of sperm would get through. But when the the sperm hits the outside of the egg, it secretes a little enzyme that digests just enough of the mucus so the sperm can swim through the force field to get inside. And at that point, a genetic message gets sent out, no more sperm is allowed in. But that one that got through, is the one that impregnates. So how does that happen? That enzyme in the head of the sperm is completely zinc dependent. So if the man has a zinc insufficiency or a zinc deficiency, he's firing duds. Hmm. And he's got plenty of sperm count, okay sperm motility, but he's firing duds because of a zinc deficiency. And we've had this happen a number of times over the years. And so we just won't see a couple unless the couple comes because we have to rule out that uh, the man doesn't have a zinc deficiency. Because when you fix that, I've had three three or four cases over the years. The couple was pregnant in a couple of weeks uh, just by giving the man zinc. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And as you say, yeah, yeah, I started coaching just just women, and then I'm like, now there's you're missing the whole other side of the equation. So yes. and getting people just even on the same page in this this journey too to be able to you know open up dialogue ar- around it because it's very it's very painful, and many people have been struggling for years and years. 
it's really important to open up a dialogue. You bet. Mm -hmm. So as far as couples that are trying to conceive, recommending both of them to go gluten-free, can you elaborate on that? I think you've got a, got a study that you've, you've um, uh, referenced. Yes, we published a study in the uh, Journal of uh, uh, Practical Gastroenterology in October of 2009. And uh, I'll send you the study. It's called mm -hmm. Celiac Disease and Reproductive Health. And so that um, we can make it available to all of your uh, listeners. Thank you. And in there, there's, I think it's 65 uh, references. Let me just see. Oh, no, 72. 72 studies that uh, associate infertility with a sensitivity to wheat, whether it manifests as celiac disease or not. Uh, for men, when they have a sensitivity to wheat, it can uh, negatively affect what's called androgen resistance. We've heard of insulin resistance, and insulin resistance is the precursor to when a person's developing diabetes, that the insulin is not working anymore to get the sugar inside the cell, and uh, uh, that the body is resistant to the insulin. So those people get higher blood sugar levels because the sugar is not getting inside the cell. And so those people get diagnosed with uh, type 2 diabetes, and they're usually, they're not given insulin. They've got plenty of insulin. They're given metformin or glu glucophage, mm -hmm. whose jobs it is to blast the insulin inside the cell, as opposed to opening a door handle and opening the door to get into the cell which is what insulin is supposed to do, the door is locked. And so insulin can't get in. So glucophage or metformin has to come in uh, with their double-barreled shotgun kind of approach and just blast through to get inside the cell. That's insulin resistance. And that progresses and progresses um, into developing diabetes and more severe cases of diabetes. There's something called androgen resistance. And that means testosterone mainly testosterone, that testosterone doesn't work properly. It doesn't open the door uh, to get inside the cell of testosterone-loving cells. And a wheat sensitivity can cause an androgen resistance in a large percentage of men. Yeah, I think that's it's so important because I think when people do... Maybe they just think the one partner has a, has an issue and then not like, so basically for you, you're saying full stop, people that are struggling with fertility, both couples to go gluten-free. Now, is there a period of time that you say that or what's your recommendation? Oh, goodness, yes. Um, it's gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free, mm -hmm. and that's for three months. That's a good amount of time. And you should notice that you're feeling like a million bucks. And if you're not feeling like a million bucks, then there's something else you're missing. Either the microbiome needs to be worked more directly or there's other food sensitivities in there along with the wheat and dairy and sugar. Yeah, so dairy, gluten, and processed sugar. Yeah, we have people do an elimination diet, so taking out dairy, gluten, soy, corn, peanuts, and eggs for 10 days and then reintroducing so they can see how it feels and then yes. you know, if there's a sensitivity using testing. Marvelous, um, yeah. Yeah. And so what about, so if someone finds out they have a food sensitivity to gluten and then they get pregnant, what's your take there about reintroducing it during pregnancy and the risk for the child? There's a lot of risks. Uh, premature births are common. Miscarriages are common. Stillbirths are common. Uh, uh, intrauterine growth retardation is common. And there are many studies that show when these people that are having these symptoms go gluten-free, they do so much better that their next pregnancy is a full-term, uh, healthy, developed baby. There, there are so many different venues by which getting wheat out of the diet is so helpful for women and drastically reduces their incidence of these horrible uh, conditions of pregnancy and birthing, intrauterine growth, retardation, and uh, miscarriages, stillbirths, I mean, all those, those types of things, they just calm down when you reduce the inflammation. And so if wheat is a problem for you and you get it out of there, 
your body just starts functioning at a different level. And you're not sure sometimes it's all that great because it could be a really tired body and you have to do a rebuilding process uh, uh, or not. But sometimes that's the case. Okay. Okay, so the difference between celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Yes. Celiac disease is whatever, where everyone cut their teeth in learning about uh, wheat. And so unfortunately, there are some uh, old timers and old time thinkers who believe that if you have a problem with wheat, it's going to show as celiac. And if you don't have a problem, it won't show. Right. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. You know, there's a lot more to it than that. But the, the bottom line is that when people go wheat-free, um, they just feel better within a short period of time. It doesn't take long at all. And if someone wants to know, well, do I really need to do this? Um, the rule of thumb is not everyone has to go gluten-free but most everyone will benefit from going gluten-free. That there are a few people out there who can eat wheat and not have an autoimmune reaction. Maybe, um, oh, this is just a guess, but maybe 15% of the country can have a little wheat once in a while, and they've not. Wheat, wheat is a minor irritant. Uh, the immune system in your gut looks at it as a minor annoyance. And usually it'll let it go by, it'll let you eat it, won't, it won't cause a reaction. But the incidence of celiac disease and wheat sensitivities has skyrocketed in the last 60 years. Mm -hmm. there's, uh, it's a, there's a four-fold increase, four-fold, in healthy young men. This is really a cute story. At Mayo Clinic, they found a bunch of blood in a freezer that hadn't been opened in many, many years. And it was, uh, how many? 7,900 blood samples from Air Force personnel in the early 1950s. And usually the tubes that store the blood when it's frozen, back then the tubes would dissolve. Even though they were frozen, they dissolve within a year. And so the blood wasn't good anymore. Uh, but for some reason, I think there was a Freon leak or something, a minor small leak. It was much colder in there than it should have been. So those 7,900 samples of blood were still good. The rubber stopper had not decayed. And if you're a researcher at Mayo Clinic, you've just died and gone to heaven. <laughs> you're a kid in a candy store because no one has access to blood that's 60 years old and still fresh. No one. It's unheard of. But here it was. And so what did they do with it? These young men, there weren't many women in the Air Force in the early 50s. So these young men, they took these 7,900 men and they compared it with 9,000 men from the same clinic or from the same county that Mayo Clinic is in who had come in for physicals. And so they compared their blood with the blood of these servicemen from the early 1950s. And they found that the, the men today have four times more celiac disease than earlier men in the, uh, in the group that we studied for today. So there's a four time increase in the frequency of celiac disease. It's fourfold higher now. And then they looked at how long people live because with the current people that they're checking, they knew when she was born, the, the woman, they knew when they were born. And the incidence of celiac disease today for the young men that were diagnosed today, they, the statistics are clear. If you're diagnosed with celiac disease in your early 20s, what's your expected lifespan? When are you likely to die? At what age? And so all those numbers are worked out now. Mm -hmm. And they found that there's a fourfold increase in early death to people diagnosed today than people who were diagnosed in the 1950s. And it's a almost fourfold increase in the number of people and almost a fourfold increase in dying early. 
because they, they followed the vets from the 1950s and they followed them for the next 60, 70 years. They're veterans, so they've got records of their health because uh, they would use the VA for their health. And so they knew how many had died and what they died of. And they compared it to the records for today, young men today, the expected lifespan. So four times more and four times earlier death. And it's just startling to it's see shocking. this. Yeah. And this had nothing to do with GMO. This is before okay. GMO. This was published in 2003, I think it was, this study. And GMO came on the market in 1996. So uh, these young men today that have this problem, it was very unlikely because GMO was pretty rare until the last few years where it's very common now. So this is just a sensitivity thing that more people are sensitive. So I said that wheat is a minor irritant, but what happens with the amount of toxins that we're exposed to today, your immune system in your gut trying to protect you becomes trigger happy. It's just shooting chemical bullets at so many different compounds trying to protect you. And so here comes the minor annoyance wheat. The guy says, you know, I've had enough of you. You're out of here because the immune system is hyperactive now and doesn't want any more insult. So when you cross that line, it's called loss of oral tolerance. And that can be when you're two years old, 22 years old, or 92 years old. When you cross that line, now you become sensitive to wheat, and now the whole cascade begins, the inflammatory cascade begins. Yeah, and so you're saying 85% of people have, have an intolerance to wheat, and then 15% could be okay. And then at some point, that loss of oral tolerance is something could tip it over, be it anything. That's correct. Stress, lifestyle. Uh, correct. And it can be when you're two years old, 22 years old, 92 years old. Whenever you lose oral tolerance, whenever your body says, that's enough, no more. And mm -hmm. with the amount of toxins, you know, the Journal of Pediatrics published a paper that said, it's 250 pounds of toxic chemicals per person per day that are being dumped in the United States every day. 250 pounds per person per day, every single day. And all of those chemicals, we get exposure to so many of those chemicals uh, in our environment, from the air we breathe to the plastic materials that we're touching and you know, the water that we're drinking and the beverages we're drinking, that we're exposed to these toxic chemicals and we're, we're in this soup, this toxic soup that has a dramatic effect on fertility, just a dramatic effect mm -hmm. because you're so inflamed. The body's inflamed and the body is stressed and there's no animal on the planet that gets pregnant when they're stressed. That the, there's an override mechanism to prevent pregnancy when an animal's under great stress because they won't be able to survive. They won't be able to protect themselves or their baby uh, uh, if there's a threat, like a saber-toothed tiger or something like that. And remember, we have the same body as our ancestors thousands of years ago, exactly the same body. And so what our ancestors were fighting that caused stress was saber-toothed tiger, and you don't mess with that. This is a survival mechanism. She's not gonna get pregnant if there's a saber-toothed tiger in the area. Well, it's the same today with the amount of stress that we're all under. It's the same type of thing, taxing your adrenal glands, and you cannot get pregnant if you're under a lot of stress. It doesn't happen. And many of us have heard stories or had a family member that tried to get pregnant and couldn't, and they couldn't, and they couldn't, and they were heartbroken, and when they decided to adopt, all of a sudden, they got pregnant, you know? So mm -hmm. I mean, we've all heard stories like that, that it happens and it's that the, they're not under stress anymore. And so the body relaxes enough to allow a pregnancy to occur. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's the mental, emotional, and also the, the environmental toxins, the structural stress, so something's out of alignment, and then also the, the diet or gut infections or inflammation, like you said. Correct, mm -hmm. correct. And there's one more and that's electromagnetic. Yes.
Yeah. Critically important, critically important. I was with my friend last night, Dr. Lauren Noel, and she was telling me that there are clothing now that EMF shields and there are blankets that you can wear or wrap yourself in. There's a tummy pack uh, that you wrap your tummy around so baby isn't exposed to the wireless in all the places mm. that we're in you know, at any one time. So there's a lot of things we can do to reduce the amount of stress we're under before and during a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you talked about how in the beginning there about what, you know, when we think of a gluten, gluten sensitivity, we you know, immediately think that it's, it's, it's a digestive issue. And then you're talking about the eight, eight different components or that's only one out of eight. Right. Um, yeah. So why can just focusing on that can be misleading as someone could, could miss potentially, you know, an issue with, with gluten for them? Oh, when I show the doctors and lectures I give, when I show the doctors a study on the eight to one ratio, I say, so if you're looking for gut pain before you're going to check for a sensitivity to wheat and possible celiac disease, you'll find it, but you'll miss seven others that have the problem because they don't have gut pain. And so it's such a very, very common scenario is that people wait, you know, towards the end of the day that... They, they make appointments to see doctors or they're, they're given an appointment you know, at, at the end of a day when they're tired and they're worn down a little bit. And all of this comes into play. You know, you can't look at someone and say, well, your progesterone's low. Let's just give you some progesterone. Mm -hmm. uh, progesterone is very helpful. Uh, at the, the bigger question may be, why do you have a low progesterone? And where's the emergency break that's holding back your body from making enough progesterone uh, so that you can maintain the right amounts during a pregnancy and afterwards? It's always better to get your hormones naturally if you can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so as far as the, with gluten sensitivity, um, so if we find out that we're sensitive to gluten, which basically we're saying right now, if, if you're trying to conceive... And, and you're struggling with infertility, go gluten-free, dairy-free, processed sugar-free for, th for, for three months, at least, see how you feel. And then if we do discover that we're sensitive to it, how long, if we happen to get glutened or, you know, how, how long does it take the gut to heal if we are sensitive, then we have some? It takes at least three to six months when you stop eating wheat for the antibodies to calm down. This is why when you get a vaccination for measles, they give you a shot of the bug measles and your brain says, what's this? This is not good for me. You general. And in your immune system, you have army, air force, Marine Corps generals sitting around with nothing to do. General, you now are general gluten. Take care of this. Uh, or, uh, I'm sorry, I, start, I started with measles. So they give you a shot of measles, for, you know, in a vaccination. And your brain says, general, take care of this. And general measles builds an assembly line. The assembly line starts producing soldiers. They're called antibodies. And these are special forces. And they come out with high-powered rifles, these antibodies. And they get into the bloodstream and they attack whatever they're designed to attack. In this example, it's measles. So they're going through the bloodstream and your blood's just a highway. You know, there's lots of traffic on the highway. It's all going the same direction, but it's just a highway. And they're traveling through the highway with these high powered rifles, wherever they see measles, boom, they're firing a chemical bullet. Boom, boom, boom. And when all of the measles bugs have been killed, all the measles bugs from the vaccination, when they're all dead, general measles says, okay, turn off the assembly line. I don't need any more soldiers right now. So the assembly line gets turned off, but the most recent soldiers that were produced have a shelf life of two to four, two to six weeks. And so you still have elevated antibodies for two to six weeks after you've turned off the water. You know, after you have said, okay, that's it. Uh, uh, no more, uh, no more need for antibodies, but still for two months, three months, 
uh, the antivirus that were produced at the end of the cycle, they've got a life of two to three months. So that means two or three more months. So you, you had an exposure, you produce, you turn the assembly line on to kill the invader, the antibodies kill the invader, and the, the assembly line stays on, stays producing for two to four months after you turn the assembly line off. The antibodies will keep, they've got a lifespan of two to four months, even though you've turned off the assembly line to make more soldiers. So when you're exposed to wheat, and let's say you did a test, it came back, you were wheat sensitive, you got off wheat, you felt really great, and now you just had a piece of your, birth, your daughter's birthday cake last night, and so far you're doing okay today, you mm -hmm. feel okay, but you know you're just not on your A game. And the lifespan of antibodies that get turned on will be somewhere between four and six weeks, which means that one little cookie one little crouton, when you turn um, general measles back on, when the, uh, it's called a memory B cell. And when you turn the memory B cell on, because general measles or general gluten is vigilant the rest of his life, that's his job for the rest of his life. And he's called a memory B cell. And that's how vaccinations work. That's why if you go to Africa, you need vaccinations months and months ahead of time for yellow fever and dengue fever and all these weird fevers. And if you go back to visit 20 years later, you just need a booster shot two weeks before you go. Yeah. Yeah. You just have to wake up general uh, yellow fever or general dengue fever, uh, whatever it is. And the same happens with wheat. So if you make elevated antibodies to wheat, then for the rest of your life, you're gonna have general wheat and general wheat is called a memory B cell. And the memory B cells will stay. As far as I know, memory B cells stay for life. There's no way to get rid of the memory B cells. So then we're looking at that three to six months to recover from that exposure that you've had to then heal on, you know, work on the gut and heal your body from that. Exactly, that's exactly right. Yeah, I have the issue with my, with my son who's gluten sensitive and he's 14 and he literally continually goes out and eats pizza. I'm literally, I'm just throwing my hands up. I don't even know what to do with them anymore. Because at the home, at home, we're gluten, dairy, corn free. Guy goes out and when he has gluten, it makes his mood just, he's very foul and angry when he, and then he goes out and he continually keeps having it. And, and we're just back to square one, like every month. So he feels better, has it, it goes on and on and on. It's just the most frustrating thing ever. Yeah. There's a couple things you can try. Uh, the first one is CBD. CBD usually will dissipate the anger. There's a component in wheat called gluteal morphins, and in dairy it's called casomorphins. And gluteal morphins and casomorphins, they're a narcotic-like substance. So they bind onto your opiate receptor sites, CBD does, so that people that have elevated antibodies to this part of wheat called gluteal morphins if they have elevated antibodies, they usually have a harder time transitioning off of wheat. They start getting withdrawals. Mm -hmm. they, they don't know. The, I'm fine. I just, I just want some wheat, mm -hmm. but I'm fine. I'm fine. But I just think, you know, I, I choose. I'd like to have some wheat. You know, people here in Southern California have a whole language that can justify irrational behavior. You know, I choose to have some wheat. But it kills you. No, I don't see that. And I said, okay, well, here, just sign this. And I have him sign a form that says, I understand Dr. Bryan has explained to me the dangers of wheat, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I said, you know, they'll put that on your tombstone someday. I'm going to do that anyway. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's frustrating. Oh, geez. Yeah. So, so we have our couples, we run a, a GI map stool test, and it looks at the uh, anti-gliden. And so that comes back, we find that comes back high. Sometimes people want to then test for celiac. So what is your take on, on doing that? Is there fal false positives? Is there anything that should we just assume and sensitive and stay away? Like, what's your take? Oh, that's a really good question. The test for celiac, the blood test for celiac is a, 
uh, test for something called transglutaminase 2. That's the most common marker now. There's another one called endomycium. And what I'm going to talk about is true for both of them. That in lab medicine, the terms are sensitivity and specificity. And you want those to be as high as possible. So in most labs, the sensitivity and the specificity in these kinds of tests is around 8.2 or 82%, 86%, 90%, so for a decent cop, and uh, 95% and more for both endomycium and transglutaminase. But the problem with that blood test is when they proved how accurate it was, they bought the blood of people with celiac disease. And the laboratory's laws say you have to check at least 40 people to come up with your reference range. Hmm. So they did that for 40 people. They came up with a reference range. The problem is that test is extremely accurate for people who are at the end stage of celiac disease, where their intestines are all worn down. And you don't get a diagnosis of celiac disease unless your microvilli are all worn down. It's called villus atrophy, uh, but you have to have that in order to get a diagnosis of celiac disease. Anything less than that can be diagnosed, but I'll finish this story first and then we'll talk about another one. So it's 96, 97, 100% accurate and sensitive for celiacs, but the blood they use to be diagnosed with celiac, you have to have total villus atrophy. You're and damage in the intestines has to be at the extreme. That's what they call celiac disease. But when they did studies looking at people that had partial villus atrophy, so there was some damage, but it wasn't severe yet, or the earlier stage of inflammation. And when they looked at people on the celiac spectrum that were early enough and just had inflammation, then the accuracy of the test is 27 to 32%. It comes back wrong seven out of 10 times with false negatives, saying there's no problem when there really is. It's just the technology they were using wasn't good enough to bring it up to speed. And this is the blood test, not the actual scope or going. Correct. Correct. Yep. The scope is looking to see have, have your uh, microvilli worn down completely or not. Okay. And so then the best test for gluten sensitivity and celiac, ah. wheat zoomer or Cyrex, what, which one's? Good, good question. So the tests looking at transglutaminase for celiac disease are right on the money if you're at the end stage of celiac disease. If you're at an earlier stage of celiac disease, they're wrong seven out of 10 times with false negatives. Yeah. So what you really want to look at is antibodies to wheat. Not to uh, transglutaminase and endomycium, they're the manifestations of the autoimmune disease, celiac. And they're important to look at, uh, but they're only one component. So think of proteins like a pearl necklace. Hydrochloric acid undoes the clasp of the pearl necklace. Now you have a string of pearls. And our digestive enzymes act as scissors to snip that pearl necklace into smaller pieces of the pearl necklace. Snip, 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 snip smaller and smaller and smaller until you get down to each pearl of the pearl necklace, which goes right through the intestinal wall into the bloodstream, right through. And that's normal absorption of these good fats. But what happens for a lot of people is that, see, no one, no human has the scissors to break down wheat completely. No human. We don't have the ability to do that and for most people, it will cause some inflammation for them. These peptides of poorly digested wheat sitting in the gut are triggers for inflammation, and they cause intestinal permeability or the leaky gut. Mm -hmm. That's how wheat can cause a leaky gut, is that it's these peptides of poorly digested wheat don't get identified that are the problem. So well, how do you test for this? And you mentioned the two tests, Cyrex array number three is the blood test that looks at the 10 top peptides of poorly digested wheat. 
most every laboratory in the world just looks at one. And if that one comes back negative, they say you're fine. But as you saw, there were multiple peptides of poorly digested wheat that, can, that your body can make antibodies to. But every laboratory only checks one. It's called deamidated gliden. It's a 33 amino acid peptide. So they'll check gliden and deamidase. So maybe they'll check two. Maybe. That's all they check. But there's, the science says there's at least 60, and some papers say close to 100 peptides of poorly digested wheat. That can be a problem. There's over 100. Well, why are our labs only checking one? Hmm. And there's no good answer for that. So that's why Cyrex was born in 2010. That laboratory was born, and they look at 10 peptides of poorly digested wheat. And that's been a great test to use, a really good tool. Now it's expanded, the technology's expanded, and there's a test called the Wheat Zoomer. And the Wheat Zoomer test looks at uh, 26 peptides of poorly digested wheat. So double what's, what Cyrex does. And for, I believe, less, a smaller price. So the new kid on the block that is taking the world by storm is the Wheat Zoomer. It's a remarkable test. It gives you much more useful inflammation than anything we've been able to do in the past. And I guess there potentially still is some false negatives if your immune system is, has been compromised. And so to not necessarily do that until you're at a better level because you might get a false negative? That's a really good question. And false negatives are so very, very common. Blood test comes back and says, oh, you don't have a problem. And then you say, oh, good. And you go home. But the, the tools that they check for are not very thorough. You really want to be looking at Cyrex or the wheat zoomer when you're checking for a wheat sensitivity. You're much more liable, liable to see something if you look. If you don't look and just think you've got it, well, that's usually come back to bite a bunch of people on the backside, you know, when they think like that. And would you go in to do those tests, though, if, if you've got other autoimmune diseases or lots of colds or flus or any of that stuff? Would you? Would you, you bet. Go yeah, you, you bet. Go. You okay. bet. You okay. absolutely, you absolutely want to do the test. And the wheat zoomer also is the most comprehensive test looking at intestinal permeability. It's in the same test. So the wheat zoomer is a great test to do just to see how your current lifestyle is matching up to how you feel, but also how you're feeding yourself. Mm -hmm. Very important. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the women and the couples that we work with, we find when we do the GI map stool test, it comes back with, with gut infections, parasites, bacterial infections, fungal infections, all sorts of things. So what do you think is first? Is it gut infection or the sensitivity to gluten, which then predisposes for the, is it the chicken and the egg? I, I don't know what your, your take on that is. Sometimes it's the chicken. Sometimes it's the egg. <laughs> Full stop. Yes. I don't know what else. To say on that one, you know, it's, it's never one or the other. It depends on the individual and their health history. Mm -hmm. So to really, yeah, dig further, if there is a sensitivity, look at the stool test and not just look at the stool test, then look at the diet and kind of, yeah. Absolutely. Look at everything, look at everything. Um, I just saw a new study coming out this week. Chris Kresser just sent something out about it from the Journal of Nutrients. He was talking about being potentially able to cure gluten sensitivity by being able to restore beneficial bacteria to the gut, so the bifidobacteria or the firmicides. I'm not sure. Do you have any a take on that one? I haven't seen that article, but the bottom line is you never determine if it's okay to eat wheat or not by how you feel, because it's a one to eight ratio. Uh, that's the worst marker to use. Uh, rather, you use the blood test and when you identify that you have autoimmune mechanisms, that your brain is fighting, your immune system is fighting your brain, then it makes sense to do this uh, entire thing that you're talking about and just listen to it. And then as far as suggestions for, so we find that we're sensitive to gluten, we go gluten-free, and then and then also looking at, yeah, dairy-free and processed sugar-free. Are, are there supplements that you you recommend in there along with looking at all of the lifestyle strategies as, as well? Do you have any ones that are, that you are your, your go-to, I guess, for someone that's looking to conceive? Oh, you bet. You bet. Critically important 
to heal the gut, critically important. And the first thing is to identify the triggers and stop the triggers. Once you've identified that there's a problem in the gut and that uh, you have intestinal permeability and or you have gluten sensitivity, then the, there's two categories of nutrients. One is preventive. The other is therapeutic, to put the fire out or to prevent a fire. So the owner of a bicycle company here in the town where I live noticed that his energy was slowing down, slowing down, slowing down. And uh, he saw that I, I saw him one day. And so he asked if I could make some comments. And so I did. The first thing is to stop throwing gasoline on the fire, of course. You know, stop eating the food to calm down the inflammation. And to help heal the intestines, there's a concept called a pleiotropic approach. Pleiotropic, it's a great Scrabble word. And it means all roads lead to Rome. You know, many approaches to the same thing. So there's a lot of nutrients out there that have been shown to help heal the intestines. Glutamine and curcumin and fish oils. And there are many out there. So I put together these packs because no one is going to take 15 or 20 things a day. They're just not going to do it. Open all the bottles and do that. But I put these packs together. They're called gluten sensitivity packs. And Mrs. Patient, there's 22 nutrients in this pack that help to turn the genes on to heal the gut. But it's one pack. Can you take one pack a day? There are seven pills here, 22 nutrients. Can you take one pack a day? Well, yes, I can take one pack. Good. There you go. That's all you need to do from the pills. And the second thing is colostrum. Mm -hmm. Colostrum is mother's milk. And every newborn baby has severe intestinal permeability. And they've got to change that pretty quick after they come out. And that's done by colostrum. That mom's colostrum turns the genes on in the gut to heal the permeability and to reduce the inflammation, put the fire out. So colostrum for at least a couple of months every day and one gluten sensitivity pack every day. And the results are usually um, quite impressive. People really like that. Hmm, I love it. Yeah, simple. So as far as a, any kind of recommendations you have for a book or a website or an app, anything that, that you like, well, we'll obviously link to all, to all of your uh, resources, but is there anything else that you're just loving right now? I'm loving book my, my new book that just came out last week Sweet. Uh, is called You Can Fix Your Brain, One Hour a Week to the Best Memory, Productivity, and Sleep You've Ever Had. And it's a excellent, I'm so proud of it. It's really a good book. And so far, it's been ranked number one in Amazon in 10 different categories. Oh, congrats. And thank you. And number 36 in all books on Amazon. It's number 36 right now, which is what? Yeah. That's very cool. That's very cool. Um, it's a great book for people to learn. Uh, and the principles that you learn and you apply here are principles that benefit your entire life. So uh, you'll see such great benefit when you do the gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free, take the gluten sensitivity packs one a day, plus a scoop of the protein powder uh, once a day. And the results are dramatic and quick for most people. Yeah, that's great. I, I love that. So that, the book is called You Can Fix Your Brain. And then any success story you'd like to share around pregnancy? You shared it in the beginning, but um, I'm not sure if there's anything else that comes to mind. Oh, thank you. There's nothing else that comes to mind right now. You know, there are many, many couples we've got who write every year and say thank you and that kind of thing. But yeah. There's nothing special I can think of at the moment. Thank you. Okay, okay, no problem. And then you have a free gift for our audience. So it's a gluten-free fact pack. And so it's got a whole bunch of things in there. Did you want to describe what they would get when they, uh, when they opt into that? Oh, you bet, you bet. We did this thing called the Gluten Summit. And uh, it was the first health summit online. We did this in a couple of years ago, 2013. And it's amazing to see what's happened in the last five years, how many summits have come out mm -hmm. and so many different topics. 
you know, it's just continually going. But the interviews in the Gluten Summit are just remarkable. You hear world-class scientists talking about uh, wheat and how it affects the heart, for example, or how it affects the brain. And when you hear these stories, you're just, your jaw drops uh, just again and again. And so the best of the Gluten Summit is one of the uh, gifts that we have for you. And then three articles. One's called Differentiating Gluten-Related Disorders. That means the difference between celiac disease and wheat germ or gluten insensitivity, as an example. The second handout is the conundrum of gluten sensitivity. And the third is the U.S. perspective on gluten-related disorders. So these are um, three different articles that you can read that are really interesting reading to get a big picture overview about wheat. And then the last thing, because there's five things on this package for all you guys, last thing is a $10 cash certificate to use at the store, the doctor.com, or uh, whatever it is that you're going to order. And the doctor.com, that's a DR, so T-H-E-D-R.com, right? Yep. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks so much for coming on today. It was sharing your words of wisdom. It's extremely informative and educational, and I appreciate very much your time. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Awesome. Hey there, Sarah Clark here. So are you struggling to have your baby? First of all, please know that my heart goes out to you. I support couples worldwide who are struggling with infertility to conceive and have healthy babies. Women like Rita, who gave birth to her beautiful daughter after following my fertility coaching system. Or Danielle, who after two failed IUIs was able to get pregnant after a supercharger fertility discovery call with me. So here's how you get my help for free. So I offer a free supercharger fertility discovery call. And on that call, I'll create a plan with you that is going to help you fast track your success. So this call is not for everyone. And I'm really picky about who I get to speak with. And I have a strict but totally reasonable criteria that needs to be met in order for us to move forward. So here's who I can help. So first of all, you need to be able to explore your infertility diagnosis in a new light. So this offers for people who are open-minded, they're coachable, and if you can do that and want to double or triple your chances at the fertility clinic or get pregnant, awesome. So let's get on the phone and chat. Also, you must be an action taker. So someone who's committed to seeing results, you're able to follow directions. Don't worry, I'm not gonna ask you to do anything bizarre. But if you're one of those people who like to consume a ton of information, but don't like to spend time implementing and seeing results, then the call's not really for you. So I only wanna spend time with people who are genuinely committed to their own success. So just click on the link in the show notes and apply, or go to fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on the free consult. So it's a really short application that just tells me about your health, how long you've been trying to conceive, and how soon you'd like to be pregnant. So seriously, this is going to be the best time you've ever spent on your fertility. Looking forward to chatting. Talk soon. Thank you for listening to Get Pregnant Naturally. Seriously, it means the world to me that you're here. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can be notified of upcoming episodes. I'm excited to offer you a special gift. If you're a U.S. resident, text FERTILE to 345-345. You'll be prompted to enter your email address and you'll receive our fertility yoga download. In this 20-minute intro video, we focus on a calming and peaceful practice to connect back to your heart. These simple fertility yoga poses can help quiet negative thoughts and make you feel more in control. Download it now and get started today. So for U.S. residents, text FERTILE, F-E-R-T-I-L-E, to 345-345. For non-U.S. residents, go to www.yogafreebie, F-R-E-E-B-I-E, dot com to access your special gift. That's www.yogafreebie, F-R-E-E-B-I-E, Dot com to access the free fertility yoga download. And I love this quote by Dr. Mark Hyman, medical director of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine and chairman of the Institute for Functional Medicine. Functional medicine is medicine by cause, not by symptom. Functional medicine practitioners don't in fact treat disease. We treat your body's ecosystem. 
We get rid of the bad stuff, put in the good stuff, and because your body is an intelligent system, it does the rest. Thanks for listening. Until next time.